The 2019 super low budget horror movie Halloween at Aunt Ethel's is a story that attempts to play on the classic fear of the creepy neighborhood shut in that people make up stories about as teenagers with no jobs, or as we see in this film, even as weirdly immature 20 something actors with no jobs before doing this piece of crap movie. The main cast looks old enough to be my substitute teacher, yet when we meet them, they're dressed in the stereotype typical schoolgirl uniforms of the Magic Academy in a Japanese comic book. Aside from a couple singularly well-framed shots, Halloween at Aunt Ethel's is a mostly frustrating watch that can barely string together enough original footage to make an hour-long indie film, starring the who's who of Florida tobacco shops, with plot holes that are almost as obvious as the racist and sexist overtones, and performances that are almost as flat as everybody's hair. Join me as the month of October culminates with a horror movie that proves there are still leading roles available for actresses over 40, playing the murderous wench who is mostly known for looking crazy and being old. Get ready to slice and dice your way to some gruesome Halloween treats in another streaming free on Tubi installment of Clip Breakdown. <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive into our favorite movies, TV movies, and other such content here on the web. And we inspect each little fun-sized morsel like we're checking your candy for razor blades. Cause it's Halloween mama and we got a sketchy neighborhood area to walk through. But before we do, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up to see even more Tubi horror broke down here here on Clip Breakdown. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love it if you could just go ahead and click subscribe, or it's even more important if you've been watching for many videos. Click subscribe and that will make me so happy. That way you'll never miss new videos from me. And if you click notifications, you'll get an update because I upload twice a week, but not always at a good time for you. So you want those notices. The horror movies that they have for free on the free streaming platform Tubi have long been a wonderful source of clip breakdowns here in this long tabled studio. And uh, I knew that it was the right move for ending Halloween with a bang. I find that low budget horror movies are a really great litmus test for the skills of a filmmaker. Can you make me scared with zero dollars or even with a blockbuster budget? Are you leaving me wondering where the witches are at? And honestly, this, I was like on the fence for a good portion of the first scene of this movie, which didn't have zero tension. I mean, there's definitely music. These old cars are always overheating, so. It's, now what? She's gotta wait a couple minutes. I agree with that tense orchestral sting. This is already a horrifying situation, being trapped in a car for a few minutes with a cisgender straight man. But what if he makes me listen to a baseball game on the radio? I will run screaming into the woods and live amongst the forest creatures. And I don't care how much coyote urine I have to douse myself in to earn their trust. Because luckily that's the top note of Adam Levine's celebrity fragrance, which is always on clearance at walmart.com. Mmm. Huh. Adam Levine by Adam Levine. Let your tattoos be your personality. Ding. Uh, uh, uh. Mm. uh oh, I can already hear the coyotes coming. Let's try to move it along. Let's, let's keep it going. Oh, one thing I failed to mention is that Aunt Ethel, Aunt Ethel, that's gonna be a flippy floppy thing. This movie is not an earnest horror, although it sort of feels that way at moments. It's more like a horror comedy, potentially inspired by things like scary movie. Although the jokes tend to be, I mean, not funny, but also the same format. Like you'll get a lot of people being like, blah, blah, blah. Blah, what? Uh, blah, blah. Like people saying what a lot as like the after the setup. Just here's an example. Oh, you like the party? I got an idea of what we can do while we're while we're waiting. Oh yeah, what's that? Butt stuff. What? Kissing. I, th I thought we could just kiss. Honey, don't act like you didn't hear. It's you mumbling through the dialogue, not him, the horny teenage boy. He said he wants you to finger him in the butt. I don't know why that feels like the perfect sentence for me to practice my horrible Christopher Walken impression. Index finger up his sphincter. There's a lot of conversations in this movie where it sounds like only one of the actor's voices is getting picked up by the microphone, but at least you can tell that they used a boom mic and not 
not just the tiny pinhole microphone that's included on board with the camera. So as they're sitting there, we see that this woman, I don't know what her name is, the girl who dies at the beginning, she calls her sister, who we're supposed to see that there's like a picture of her on the phone saying Mandy. And it comes up later, but I wish they had made a stronger connection here to the character that we meet later. Like if we hear this girl on the phone doing some cute little inside joke or recognizable exchange that then Mandy can mention later, I would be able to connect that this this person is the sister of one of our supporting characters before the very last scene of the movie, which is when I noticed what they were trying to do in this. Anyway, after she refuses to put out, that boy leaves a girl, our blonde girl dressed like a prisoner, on the side of the road. It's Halloween, by the way. That's why she's in an orange jumpsuit, looking for a place to use the phone, um, which confuses me because this is a very populous neighborhood, as we'll see tomorrow. But she goes to the creepiest oldest house where there's some wood shop with a whirring machine. It's like building tension in a way that I've always seen before. The loud machinery that someone slowly walks towards, that was done in the crazies. It's just an example I can remember. Either way, as the girl is looking around, she starts to realize she's being followed. So she gives chase and falls backwards into an empty swimming pool. Again, we've seen that many times before, Neon Demon. Also the Halloween remake by Rob Zombie. When she's down down there, she sees somehow her boyfriend who had left and, you know, we kind of saw him run into an old lady in the street. He's bleeding in that pool and just as she turns around, she gets an ax in the head by our main antagonist. But we don't get, we don't see her in full yet. I'll say that although this movie is inconsistent, there are several shots in the movie that it seems like the filmmaker clearly cared about and put a fair amount of time and effort into creating, despite them being shots that that aren't crucial to the main plot at all. Think like semi-fancy establishing shots, like these. I'm your man DJ Dick from 105.6 The Mix, putting hits all up in your man. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I should have said this before, but trigger warning takes place in Florida. I'm just kidding to all of the Floridians out there. I know that your beautiful state has some of the most progressive drainage systems in the world to keep alligators out of the parking lots for your vape juice stores and methadone clinics. You're all really making it work out there, living in the swamps like Shrek people. So that overhead shot of the girl in the pool was pretty. I liked that the blue orange jumpsuit really helped her like pop out against the black background. I wish we had been able to see her fall into the pool from that angle. It would have been more impressive. And then for this sort of shot where we, we crane down to see the girls walking, yes, it's cliche to start the movie with the expositional sounds of a morning radio show. And yes, the DJ's voice along with that bad CGI balloon are giving me 1990s Kool-Aid man. And yes, the solar flare and golden color correction just sort of disappears suddenly at the end of that shot. And uh, that's it. I just find that my approval ratings go up when my criticisms contain the word yes, and I show my teeth. <laughs> yes, you really tried to make a movie, buddy. And it is very yes, yes. Yes, 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 yes. See how irresistibly genuine that came off? Now just imagine how much I smell like coyote piss and you'll really be getting the full Nick D experience. Nicky D smells like piss. That's my new jingle. Anyway, so we we kind of pan down and see the girls. It's clearly a drone that accomplished probably both of these shots. And normally you would want like a jib to do a smooth crane down type of thing, but because they just sort of landed a drone, it feels very rickety. Also, the movie tries to do this speed ramp thing throughout that we've seen in lots of popular movies, but it's hard to do unless you're shooting at a higher frame rate than they seem to be. Anyway, let's meet our main characters in this Dunk, dunk, dunk thing. Mmm, uh, uh. 
okay, close-ups. We haven't even seen their full faces yet, but I can already tell that this movie only hired a special effects makeup artist, and the actresses were on their own for the everyday beauty looks. One of these women has clearly been painting her eyes with a very specific liquid liner shape every day since senior year of high school, while the other has eyebrows so patchy that somewhere in Beverly Hills, Anastasia is rolling in her marble sarcophagus. Oh, she's not dead, just a wealthy vampire. Anastasia Beverly Hills, let me succubus your blood ubus. Anyway, what a fun montage of two girls walking. I love how it started with that sexy shot of their colonial pilgrim shoes. The fact that those feet belong to anyone other than a leprechaun is the greatest plot twist in cinematic history. This movie, I won't make any assumptions, but it has the look and feel that I've seen tend to occur when uh, some straight guy makes a movie without having the good sense to hire some girl, gay, or they that can be in charge of making sure that the hot girls don't try to get on camera and act hot while they're wearing dusty ballet flats. That's how I got most of my work in the art department on indie films, by just knowing when someone has a mascara on or not. If you're a filmmaker and you don't know the first thing about hair, makeup, or costumes, I think it's very important to hire someone whose whole job it is to sit on set with a black outfit and a bad attitude so they can hold up production by applying six individual lashes to each actress and borrowing painful designer heels from some wardrobe stylist they met in the bathroom while doing cocaine at a gay bar. But I don't know, or don't, but at least maybe I wouldn't have had time to notice all of these unpolished details if this walk down Old Town Road didn't feel as long as when early humans made their first trek across supercontinent Pangaea. Listen to me remembering seventh grade social studies. Like, does this introduction sequence really need all of these cuts? I get it now. Because of this, we're actually getting some important character development. We now know that these pretty girl like to twirl. Pretty girl like to twirl, twirl, twirl. Damn it, I just wrote another Charlie XCX song by accident. But anyway, it's been 20 seconds of these walking women who I guess go to private school and I guess are in high school, even though not on this planet. They are trying their best to act out a scene in the script that was probably written as two Two hot young students slink sexually towards their middle school. Like, that's weird. And in any case, 20 seconds is plenty of time. Oh, nope, there's that music again. Aw, I'm glad those two girls from the first scene of The Ring are still friends. Even though one of them turned into a withered corpse frozen in an eternal scream. I don't really talk to anyone from high school anymore. Not even the kid who donated his kidney to save my life. What was his name again? Matthew Blood Type Match? Johnny Organ Harvest? If you're watching Johnny Organ Harvest, please don't be a stranger. Feel free to follow me on Instagram. This extended boob featuring strut sequence is officially over. Time to listen to these characters have a completely normal and natural sounding conversation. Have you ever killed anything? What? Have you ever killed a bird? A cat or anything? Have you ever just wanted to kill someone? I don't know, maybe. Hey, what's up with you and Ricky anyway? Wow, this conversation is spanning a wide variety of topics really fast. Hey girls, how about enough with the 20 questions and a little more practicing how to walk like a normal person? Often the actors will be told to move very slowly for this type of walk and talk because the camera operator is moving backwards uh, to shoot it. But only our main character, Melissa, on the right side of the screen is making that look like it could possibly be normal walking. Like you gotta make the short strides look casual. On the left side, we have Blondie McBaby steps, shuffling along and mumbling about her homicidal urges. She said, hey, have you ever thought about maybe stepping on a stray cat? And did Ricky buy your tickets to the spring formal? Like, uh, those sentences feel really disconnected to me, little bunny foo-foo, and I wanna sit next to someone else in homeroom from now on. But wait, cause we're about to meet the real antagonist. Oh, you wanted more mystery or a later reveal? Too bad. There she is. Who? Old Aunt Ethel. Like 20 years ago, she killed her entire family in that house. And all the neighbors could hear someone inside yelling, Stop Aunt Ethel. 
Please, God, stop, Anne Ethel. Ooh, that was me. Because she was taking off her special diabetes socks way too close to where I was making caramel apples. I felt like the air that was touching her weird rotten foot was getting all over the place. It's it's gross. This part of the legend that explains how old Aunt Ethel got her name mm, never comes back around. Even when it could have been used to, you know, semi good effect later in the film. But anyway, now Mandy, yep, this is Mandy. You're supposed to know everyone's first names like the second you first hear them to understand this plot. But anyway, her boyfriend shows up. His name is Mark. Every year on Halloween, she lures the kids inside. Says she has very special candy. Candy that's gonna make all their wishes come true. She slaughters them. Okay, well, maybe we don't have to jump to conclusions. What if her magical candy is real? And those kids just happen to wish that they never had to go to school again, or that they got their picture to be on the news, or like that maybe they wished for their body to get chopped up and buried. I don't know, I'm just saying. Why is society always so hesitant to make sure the innocent children are never blamed? Meanwhile, Mark demonstrates his understanding of both American law and Latin with this misinterpretation of corpus delecti. Then why isn't she in jail yet? Because if you don't have a body, you don't have a crime. She turns all the kids' body parts into Halloween treats. Ugh, that old Aunt Ethel. She figured out the perfect crime because once a dead body is covered in milk chocolate, it falls under the jurisdiction of the American Confectioners Association. And I mean, they let Willy Wonka walk free, no matter how many kids he watched drown in hot cocoa, or get roasted by squirrels, or dissolve in a vat of hot liquid nougat. Yeah, see, they had to cut that scene out of the movie. Theaters complained that the sight of melted, bliss during flesh might negatively impact the concession stand's sale of cheesy bread. Thanks commercialism, another potentially cool movie gets ruined. Also, it's very confusing and unrealistic how they couldn't just say Halloween candy. Why oh why is a movie filled with this copy and paste dialogue where people say basically the same thing two or three times. She turns all the kids' body parts into Halloween treats. The body parts that she doesn't turn into Halloween treats? Halloween treats from body parts she did them turneth? That's what you sound like right now. At some point, you have to stop verbally explaining the concept and let something play out on screen. Like, I'm very intrigued to see how some old lady gets people in the neighborhood to eat pumpkin pie with baby teeth embedded in it. Doesn't seem right. And once again, I don't like A, the character design for old Aunt Ethel, B, how quickly we see her in full broad daylight. Like, this is the very first scene and she's not scary. <laughs> That's me when the Uber Eats driver turns around to take a picture of the delivery and I'm already elbow deep inside an Applebee's appetizer trio. When I was watching this, it was this point in the movie that I knew I wanted to make a clip breakdown about it. Specifically how that blush placement made me think of Betty Davis. The makeup is giving whatever happened to baby Jane. The hair is giving just the whatever part. Not that unstyled wig from an episode of Undercover Boss. I mean, they couldn't do a fully styled wig because she had to probably thwack it on and off in between takes in that uh, humid heat. Also, the titles on screen that happen over those three characters, that's where it stops. They only do it for those three. That's why I keep having to look up the names of all of the stupid boyfriends in this movie. There's two of them. I think their names are something like Dip and Jabroni, a new sitcom on NBC. Even the main titles feel derivative of the movie Halloween, but whatever. The calendar shows us that it's the 29th, two days before Halloween. Let's check in with our main girl, Melissa. Oh yeah, Melissa, it's smart to get comfortable for this, so I'm glad that you're laying down and not wearing a bra, because we're about to sit through 51 seconds of on-screen text messages. I'm gonna fast forward through that to show you the most jarring cut in any movie I've ever seen, ever. Also, I want you to hear how this scene where she's texting is underscored by a techno dance beat that sounds like the B-side from Jeffree Star's MySpace page. Ugh, 
Does the editor think that funky zoom effect made the transition feel smoother? Because it didn't. It just made it feel more like my sixth grade video yearbook. Uh, I can tell this is supposed to be a mysterious silhouette of old Aunt Ethel, but I'm actually getting quite a lot of detail on those brand new looking generic Ugg boots that the actress's granddaughter got her for Christmas at TJ Maxx. Why did they do such extensive work on the color for that random shot of the girls on the street, but not for potentially the most memorable shot of their title character in the whole movie? Okay. Anyway, they just wanted to cut over to Aunt Ethel to show her open her barn door. They cut back and forth between locations unnecessarily. And meanwhile, Melissa's still on her phone talking to other friends. <laughs> Hello. Hey girl, what you doing? You know, just twerking the fleek, right? What? I don't know. I'm not accusing anybody, but even just the background music they chose for that girl scene feels motivated by racial stereotypes. And that NYX Cosmetics Studio Concealer Palette feels cakey after about 30 minutes of wear. And actually for that part, I am accusing someone, NYX Cosmetics and their parent company, L'Oreal Beauty, for refusing to honor my loyalty points on the products that I shoplifted. I'm not gonna say that it was an anti-gay hate crime, but uh, I'm definitely I'm gonna throw the phrase out there for no reason. So you do the math. This girl whose name I don't think even comes up that much is convincing Melissa to go to the Halloween party tonight, even though she doesn't really want to. And we get more of this, like people just recycling the same dialogue again and again. You want a rag or something? Just stick two super heavy flows right up in that bitch. And you could party for four hours straight, no leakage. <laughs> What? Once again, tell me a cisgender straight man wrote this dialogue without telling me a cisgender straight man wrote this dialogue. Especially since I just said it twice and they say after the third time, one of them will appear in your mirror and take you on a first date somewhere that's way too rough, like a go-kart course. Guys, you're asking out real women, not Joey King in some uh, Netflix romance for teens. I wanna hear what she has to say and I wanna hear it twice. We party hard out here, okay ho? We partying hard tonight, okay ho. Okay ho. I love how fully developed you are, character that we never see again for the rest of the movie. How are you gonna tell her to meet you at the party and then disappear from the whole film? Could she not be the girl that Melissa catches her boyfriend cheating with later? Anyway, it sucks that this has to be her last appearance on screen. Ricky, get the <gasps> out of here. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Ugh, these wipe transitions. It's like the visual and narrative equivalent of being knocked from scene to scene by the front of a bus. Oh, and on top of that, I hope you're keeping track of the name Ricky because that's the only way you're gonna know that the pervert peering through the window is our main character, Melissa's creepy boyfriend who we've only heard mentioned by name. This is not good filmmaking. It's really important to establish characters' relationships to one another visually as soon as possible, especially for anyone like me who gets so stressed out about remembering people's names that my brain doesn't even try to hold on to that information anymore when people introduce themselves. Like I already have to use all of my brain power to navigate whether we're going for the hug or the handshake when we meet. But that's only awkward with new friends. After that, I know to just always go right to spit in my mouth. Also, at the end of this movie, they show the outtakes, which for this shot really help but illuminate the taste level of the writer slash director behind the camera. If you say so, I mean, comedy is subjective, and since that's what the director finds funny, we'll all be subjected to it. This is intercut with old Aunt Ethel, who continues to demystify herself into looking like just a normal lady who bought her hair on QVC. Most of her character development has to come through her talking out loud to nobody. Time for my famous pickled chocolates. What? Now the chocolates are pickled? You can't just keep adding weird details to the Halloween treats every time you bring them up because it's gonna be all I can focus on. Pickled chocolates, that's not even a type of food that exists. I looked it up and why the iMovie zoom in on that JPEG of her candy bar concept art? Now you're saying that she actually sells her pickled human remains covered in chocolate and people from planet Earth actually buy it? They shouldn't have included that picture because A, it's literally a slideshow and 
B, it actually makes the movie even more confusing to the audience, which is fighting for their lives right now to even make it to the 68 minute mark. Maybe the reason Ethel is turning kids into Halloween candy slash treats is because of inflation. I was at Target looking at Halloween candy and I was like, I thought this was made of corn syrup, not blood plasma. There's higher interest rates on mortgages. Gas in LA is $6 a gallon. Inflation reached an annual rate of 8.5% in March, which is the fastest in over 40 years. There's no single reason that causes inflation. The main one right now is, you know, aftermath from the pandemic, which disrupted supply chains and the geopolitical implications from Russia's invasion of Ukraine that stops a lot of global production. But uh, let's not let corporations get off that easy because they're also to blame. Like when a corporation is looking at rising costs for their goods or services, they can either absorb it to keep the prices the same, raise the prices according to inflation to pass the cost on to us, or they could raise prices beyond whatever the increased cost was so that they are still making a hefty profit in troubling times. Can you guess? which one American corporations love to do the most? It's the last one. In 2021, a corporate pre-tax profit went up over 25% year over year, which is the largest annual increase since 1976. Why are we having record profits corporations when we're also having record inflation? This summer, NPR was saying how corporations were bragging at their quarterly calls about profits that are ahead of the inflation curve. Corporations know that people expect higher prices right now, so they're trying to push it as far as they can. We need to hold uh, companies accountable and let them know publicly on Twitter, writing letters, voting with your dollar to let corporations know it's time maybe they start uh, footing some of the burden that the average American has experienced during a global health crisis. Maybe work on stabilizing prices for consumers rather than always pursuing more and more money. Just something to think about when you're buying those $8 fun size Snickers. Anyway, they do try to show us some gore. All you need to know is that this next part shows Aunt Ethel dismembering a pickled foot. While again, repeating the same phrases out loud to herself, but not in like a mentally disturbed way, more like a she should probably take some improv classes type of way. Mm, mm, I can almost taste them. I can almost taste them. I love it. Everybody loves them. I'll eat them. That's for damn sure. Alrighty, looks like Paula Dean is still doing great over there on her private streaming service. It seems like she's really living in her truth as a terrifying old bag. Oh, Paula Dean, queen of the botched morning show appearance. Sure, Paula, go apologize on Good Morning America for admitting under oath that you use racial slurs. Forget about media training, just speak from the heart. And I tell you what, if there's anyone out there that has never said something that they wish they could take back, please pick up that stone and throw it so hard in my head that it kills me. Uh, okay, Paula. I know there's a biblical quote from Jesus that sounds similar to that, but I think you're paraphrasing it in a much more visually descriptive way. It almost sounds like you want someone who thinks before they speak to come into the studio and beat you to death with a rock. And then a few minutes later, she says it again before they can cut to commercial in true Old Ethel fashion. And like I said, if you've never committed a sin, please pick up that rock, pick up that boulder and hit me as hard as you can. All right, don't worry, Paula. I'm sure that whoever decides to be the one that smashes your head will try to make it quick. Um, which rock was it you wanted us to pick up? Oh, oh, nice try, Paula. I see what you're doing. If a sinless person commits an act of murder, then they're a sinner too. You're very tricky. How did she ever think that that was gonna be a good apology? Apology. And I'll say it again for a third time if there is anyone out there who has never made casual use of the n-word and never chosen a racially insensitive party theme or who doesn't call all of the black men working at their mansion Uncle Tom then I want you to desecrate my mother's headstone and take the sharpest piece of granite and use it to slit my throat and then tear into my soft tissue in my torso with your bare hands like a badger. Like damn lady 
stop talking about that. You're, you really don't wanna be here anymore. Anyway, we get an all close up shot of this party, which is a really great way to indicate that you didn't have enough people to fill the room like you thought. To me, if you don't have enough extras to make the raucous party scene, just make it like a quiet, low key party where people are like snorting coke. And then at least you're making a realistic use of the number of people in your crowd. Anyway, here's Melissa walking into the party and getting the shock of her life. You know that time stop effect looked cooler in the director's head, but what about the makeout sound effect? Did he want that to sound like a dog eating melted ice cream off the floor? Once again, I've never seen boyfriend Ricky and Melissa ever in the same room before this. So it took a second to even realize what was going on. Plus the girl that he's cheating with is also a pale brunette. So it kind of looks like she's tripping out and watching herself as she apparently slurped ramen noodles out of her boyfriend's throat, if you're judging by the sound. Literally so much nothing happens. Like she's mad and her friend walks her home and she's obsessed for some reason with the story of old Aunt Ethel. She's new to the town, Melissa. So she's like tossing and turning, wondering about old Aunt Ethel. And then she gets out of bed and walks across the foggy town to go look inside Aunt Ethel's house. Like what was the motivation for visiting the scary lady at night. It would be cool if they, she had some personal connection to wondering about Aunt Ethel, like a missing sister from her childhood that her family made her move away and then come back. Or like, a, is the town like Derry, Maine and it where kids go missing a lot? Cause no one's mentioned anything like that. So it makes it unclear how seriously these accusations are against Ethel. Is it kid stuff or do the adults think it too? We don't know. But either way, as she's looking in the window, Melissa gets caught by our antagonist named Aunt Ethel, yes. I really don't want to ruin my appetite. Like you said, Halloween's a couple days away, right? You gonna come back to see me on Halloween? Yeah. You okay. better, young lady. That was a reenactment of me leaving my first Craigslist hookup in Southern New Hampshire. Cell phone photos were very grainy back then. You could look at someone online and your imagination like adds in a couple megapixels and suddenly you'll have yourself convinced that this person looks like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. Then after you drive into the forest for 30 minutes and he opens the door, he looks more like the evil queen from Snow White when she's disguised as the old hag. I'm talking missing teeth, riffraff haircut, and he's serving you apple slices that look visibly tainted. Oh, there's this one shot that was kind of a fun way to subvert that classic horror movie shot where a spider's web comes into focus. Only this time it's a uh, Halloween decoration. But why is there this cheerful pink background? I wish the movie had a more consistent color palette, like the orange, the bright orange and the dried out brown shades that we see in Aunt Ethel's house. Or if it's like a neon Halloween in Florida, then they should push harder for that. Like Strangers Pray at Night had that kind of style. After the breakup, next morning, Melissa breaks up with her boyfriend. You know, you're making a big mistake. I do like how even though we've already seen that Aunt Ethel is the killer, the soundtrack always implies that the real monsters among us are sh boyfriends. Now we go over to Mandy and her boyfriend, whatever, Mark. They're making love. <laughs> So the full scene is actually a lot more graphic and extensive. We see Mandy having sex with her boobs out. And just like in the rest of the movie, she does not appear as though she wants to be there. I'm not sure if she's intentionally trying to play this character with such a monotonous line delivery, or if she literally just sold her soul to get this part. And now that's just kind of how she is. Like the people who encounter a Dementor in, what is the book? Harry Potter found his platinum butt plug. Was that the third or the fourth book that I tried to shove up my ass? as a child. I'm just kidding. Although that does sound like the kind of thing that would piss off JK Rowling, AKA mother monster to the trans exclusionary radical feminists. They don't think that non-binary people actually exist as though anyone actually cares what the fuck they think. Like imagine choosing a political point of view that obligates you to become pressed and heated over things that literally don't matter to anyone else. Turfs like JK Rowling would consider me to be a cisgender man according to the gender binary. And that's how I know it pisses them off whenever I talk about my voluptuous womanly vagina. Because guess what? This is America and I can give my 
whatever name it wants. But back to Mandy and her checked out performance. It makes me feel sad to see someone look so unhappy while topless. Maybe it's that angle at which she's looking down at her boyfriend that's bumming her and also me out. She's like, wouldn't it be hot if we tried some position where I'm not looking directly into your Uncle Fester mouth? For instance, I could turn and face the other way or you could just choke me until I die because goddamn, he's got a full on Florida tool kit up in that grill. Tin roof rusted. This is all nonsense. We're watching old Aunt Ethel play checkers with nobody, literally a dead body in a wheelchair. The body is wearing the same outfit that one of the girls was wearing before, so I guess it's a classmate. Although it's not anybody we've met. Why couldn't the person that the boyfriend it was cheating on why couldn't that have been the girl that she was on the phone with with the hip-hop music and then have that girl who the cheating girl be the dead person here like then I'm like oh okay there's retribution things are connected but nope I know damn well I had six cheater oh, I'll be damned I do have six I hope she's talking about the weeks she has left to live. And I wish that this could have been more meaningful. Like if that girl in the chair was still alive and panicking and Aunt Ethel was like accusing her of cheating so she killed her. And then she realized she was mistaken. Then it shows that Aunt Ethel's like a loose cannon who she's gonna be doing whatever she wants and no one's safe. I hate that there's no signature look that defines Aunt Ethel. Like it costs nothing to distress clothing. And I don't know how to feel when her torture chamber is all rusty and and gross, but she's sipping out of a recently purchased sippy cup from the one spot at Target. She's not in the middle of nowhere, she's in the middle of a neighborhood. So like, what if they made it clear that one of her things was decorating the whole house with these, these cheesy decorations every Halloween to lure kids in? They could show her like going through some derelict dollar store shoveling Halloween crap into her basket. Then we could see like, what is it like when she interacts with the cashier? Is he weirded out? Are there customers? Are they looking at her funny? They don't give me anything to help establish Aunt Ethel as a real character in this movie who the world knows about. Instead, she seems to just be walking around wearing a button up dress that she got from Macy's. Melissa goes to Mandy's house and we meet Mandy's mom for no reason other than to embarrass some more Floridian actresses. You know what the new in thing is these days, don't you? What's that? Mills. These young guys, they love us MILFs. Ugh, come on, director. You couldn't get a better take than that? She needs to sound confident when she refers to herself as a MILF. Tell her that acting is all about reacting, and we're gonna need her to react that entire scene, but with a little less shame in her voice. She seems like she has the ability to be self-conscious, and that's not gonna work for this movie. Ugh, this movie. Mandy calls her boyfriend to get her, her weed. No reason, no reason. Will you go to Breed's and get some weed for me, please? Come on, Mandy. You know I don't like going over there. He's fucking crazy. We follow? I don't know what? Whoa, I'm so sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Great. They decided to randomly start doing family guy style cutaway gags, even though that's the only time it happens. The entire flashback there felt like it was from an episode of The New Girl in an alternate reality where everything sucks just a little bit more than it already does. And you know what? This time I definitely feel confident enough to say that this character is a racial stereotype. Similarly to that friend who wears the concealer that I don't approve of, this character of color also only shows up for one single scene as the violent temperamental drug dealer who also happens to have hip-hop music playing in the background nice the subtle racism of this scene is making it very uncomfortable to watch and look here comes some overt racism that will make the scene very uncomfortable to watch see if he has any more of that white Tahoe fine hey yeah 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 <laughs> Oh, I was feeling pretty neutral about all of the unlikable characters, but that just pushed me over the fence. I'm officially team old Aunt Ethel. It's that white Tahoe. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, old Aunt Ethel, you're racist too. I guess that caught me off guard because I didn't expect the rule of threes to be the only thing this screenwriter knew about comedy. The kids are talking about Aunt Ethel. Oh, I'm losing it. Hey, did you guys hear about Rachel? She's been missing for like three days. Oh, what happened to her? She went missing. Like, what do you think happened to her? 
I hope this doesn't sound rude, but Melissa makes a lot of facial expressions that remind me of some kind of dog. Actually, you know what? Now I'm afraid that that didn't sound rude enough. I'm just trying to tread lightly because it's a personal goal of mine to reduce the amount of times throughout the day that I call somebody dog face. Besides, uh, the real issue here isn't Melissa or the animal that we think her face is. My problem is that this joke was clearly stolen from the critically acclaimed show Search Party. She's gone missing. What do you mean gone missing? She's like a missing person. Well, where is she? That's the question. Why? No one at the table knows. The visual flair that they were trying to do with some of the shots at the beginning has completely fallen away. They could be doing a speed ramp to follow the marijuana around the circle. And the fact that they don't just shows that that wasn't the director's true visual style that was based on a unique perspective of the world. It's just him like trying to copy references from other movies like um, The Babysitter or anything directed by Mick G. Anyway, Melissa's really starting to care about the legend of old Aunt Ethel. It's like, you guys are obsessed. I wish there was a more clear reason why she can't get her out of the head. Like, did she find her locket and it's like mysterious and it might be your grandma? Like something. She's just always tossing and turning, looking sweaty. Oh God, not that stained pillowcase, Melissa. In fact, all of your bedding looks too dingy for TV. Like why do Melissa's sheets have a thicker human patina than Aunt Ethel's cutting board that she's chopping up people on? Is that the bed that your grandmother died in before a long, hot Memorial Day weekend where no one came to visit? So much head leakage. Aunt Ethel killed that girl in the wheelchair. Now she's wheeling her out and burning her body. It's the first time we see like a split screen to show multiple angles, but okay. They really just do a lot of things once in this movie. Oh, she catches that boyfriend who's like a peeping Tom touching himself outside the window, which is like not a good move if that's the haunted lady in your uh, neighborhood, but so she kills him and of course has to get real gross with it. <laughs> you won't be needing this anymore. As a filmmaker, when does it start to feel unethical, forcing this woman of a certain age to do more and more undignified things? This is someone's grandma who wanted to pursue her lifelong dream of acting in retirement. And they've got her sharing the screen with a silicone penis and bopping bloody teenagers on the head by gig number one. Her family planned the entire reunion around attending this premiere. What is she supposed to do now? They have this really unsuccessful call to action scene where Mark and Mandy start start convincing Melissa that they have to go on Halloween night, stake out Aunt Ethel's house, and catch her in the act after she tries to slaughter some kids who go in. It's like, I could have sworn there would be better ideas. <laughs> but that's what they do. That night they go and watch the house. Kids don't come around this block very often, but there's always that one. And there he is. Here we go. They'll come back out. Oh no, they never come back. Well then, maybe don't let the next one go in there. This seems like something the police should be noticing. Not that I like the police at all, F the police. But the missing kids seem like an important aspect of why you're doing all of this. So why the passive kind of watching with binoculars? Like that's the main factor of why you don't like this woman. Look, look, another kid. Oh, come on. If a parent is sending their five-year-old child to go trick-or-treating unsupervised, I don't think it's because they love cleaning up her spills or air frying her chicken nuggets for lunch every day. Why are they, how is this the plan? And there's another one that's not going home to mommy and daddy tonight. Now you see why we have to do this. We're going to kill old Aunt Ethel. You guys are crazy, you can't kill her. Why? She's killing poor innocent children, Melissa. How can you let that happen? I feel like you just let that happen twice in a row. If they were both already planning to kill old Aunt Ethel, then how is it helpful to watch as two grade schoolers march to their death? That just seems unnecessary. Oh, these kids are idiots. Earlier in the movie, we saw this stupid scene where uh, Melissa's babysitting her cousin Gio, and guess who turns up without their parents at the one house that she should have already warned him not to go to? Gio. Different Mandy, she has my nephew. It's funny how everything changes changes when it's your own family, isn't it? Well, I know exactly how it feels, Melissa. Aunt Ethel took a sister from me. She took my brother from me. 
See, the girl from the first scene who died was the sister of Mandy. And I don't know who the other guy's talking about. We didn't make a scene for that. He had to have something too, I guess. Now that Geo's in there, the girls try to look in the window and instantly get caught by old Aunt Ethel. Real good sleuthing. So they um, are kind of playing it off like they're just trick-or-treaters there to try some treats and they need to use the bathroom. Oh, and they looked in the window and saw Geo kept in a dog crate looking more bored than scared. But anyway, the girls are trying to figure out what they can use as a weapon. Did you find anything yet? Not unless we can use a toothbrush or a toilet brush. Girl, don't hold a toilet brush that close to your own face. You have no respect for yourself. I wish instead of the boyfriend having some unseen brother who was killed by this woman, he like was just going along with Mandy's revenge plot because he's in it for the sick thrill of seeing someone die. You know, then it would feel more earned when they leave the bathroom and Aunt Ethel's found the boyfriend and killed him already. So now it's, it's gonna wrap up real quick. I mentioned that there are some sparse funny moments throughout the movie, although this is the only one I can actually remember. And it's from a featured extra who has better comedic timing than the rest of the main cast. I've never had a gun before. I can't wait to try it out. You having fun, buddy? Yeah. Hey, let's check out the next house. So it's true, vaping does kill. We're now at the climax, although it's more of an anti-climax because don't expect any visual representation of a resolution, it's just talking. On this very day, 40 years ago, a witch put a curse on me. I need to deliver 31 souls for every day that the dead walk. Uh, I feel like based on what I'm hearing, Aunt Ethel's gonna have a hard time renewing her driver's license the next time. Also, why is the whole curse based around the number 31, but it happened to her 40 years ago? And Mandy at the beginning said that Aunt Ethel killed her family like 20 years ago. Those seem like real low hanging fruit in terms of adding cohesion to this script, just numbers. Aunt Ethel lets on that she's gonna be the 31st soul and that will end the curse. And Melissa uses that as a bargaining chip to save her dog crate cousin. There's a little boy in your barn. His name is Gio and he's my nephew. If I'm 31, then he's 32 and you don't have to kill him. Yeah, sure. Wait, 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 there must be another way. Girl, what is your character even doing right now? Don't throw yourself in front of the gun to save a child and then start crying that you want a third alternate option. I'm not even a witch, but somehow you're even making me feel like double homicide is gonna be the most satisfying way to end this thing but old Aunt Ethel is feeling generous. And that brings us to this admittingly shocking twist in the story when one final trick-or-treater knocks on the door. Trick-or-treat. You know, for a group of people whose original mission was to save the lives of innocent trick-or-treaters, I can't help but feel like you veered a little bit off course here, Melissa. I don't know if the kid who played the nephew is like, had to go to bed and wasn't on set, but why wouldn't he be in the room where it's like a me or him type of thing? I'm like, why didn't... There was no tension to that. And it was a trick, stupid Melissa. Although to be honest, I'm just as surprised to find out that stabbing a child in the stomach wasn't the ultimate solution to this problem. You took the 31st soul for the dead. That means that you are the cursed one now. <laughs> No. I don't mean for this to sound mean, but Melissa needs to activate more of her lower face muscles when she's acting, cause the dog thing. See, again, that was almost too nice sounding, right? Mm, you got off easy this time, dog face. Oh, I said it, Ugh, trick or treat. This witch, her big final scene, is more talking with her more stringy wig. Basically, Ann Ethel is like, now within the next 31 hours or less, you'll receive a message explaining that you're the cursed one now. I'm like, what? 31 hours or less? Is it an expedited shipping? And then she snaps her fingers and Melissa wakes up in her bedroom thinking that this might've all been a dream, but mm, Mandy's not answering her text messages. And then she goes out to the mailbox and sees this.
Uh, that book meant absolutely nothing to us in the audience, and I definitely can't read any of the handwriting in it, but sure, movie over. So yeah, I can see why that's a little frightening. But hold on, because mm, the movie doesn't end there. We also get this hip-hop music video for old Aunt Ethel. By the way, they really love the gold side of that reflector. Like, reflectors have a silver side and a gold side, and they use the gold side every time in this movie, which doesn't always look right. Speaking of bad lighting, uh, that last part. Remember 2013's viral video trend, the Harlem Shake? Well, this is the evidence tape from a Child Protective Services home visit from around that time. It was a wild, tacky era for the human race. People were wearing drop crotch jeans and calling it swaggy? Mm -mm. No wonder we can't figure out how to sustain the planet's natural ecosystem, which was already naturally sustainable up until the Industrial Revolution. They took two like soft boxes and turned them towards the camera. And then you see that gold side of the reflector that I was just talking about right behind the rapper's head. I don't know if that's the director or what. And then we just see so many of these kids who played trick or treaters trying to dance. It's too much. Also, randomly, they have the guy with the steady cam doing his camera test in front of that white background. Ugh, go to hell, movie. And despite all of the terrible storytelling and awful editing, I still feel like my least favorite part were people's hair and teeth. That's the real Halloween monster. Anyway, I hope you're all having an amazingly happy Halloween. I wanna let you know I'll be out of the country until the first week of November is over. So I will try to get, I think a video out one each week while I'm gone. And then it's right into holiday season, baby. Thanksgiving and Christmas and Kwanzaa and Hanukkah, all of them. So start filling me up with those Christmas movie suggestions. I do wanna do the Lindsay Lohan Hallmark one, but let me know what you think of old Aunt Ethel and what's your favorite to be horror Halloween movie? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to give this movie a big thumbs up and click that subscribe button so you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week so turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I'm making pickled chocolates out of children. Also I've got a Patreon where you can access exclusive bonus episodes and virtual watch parties and merch like my new enamel pins with clip breakdown iconography that you can wear and Anywhere. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you for pickling feet and dipping them in chocolate with me. I will see you next time. Happy Halloween.